Welcome to Hunting the Haunted, a new show for the Paranormal Network here at JoeBlow.com, where we dissect and discuss infamous, famous, and not so well-known cases of paranormal activity, ranging from hauntings to alien abductions and Bigfoot sightings. I'm your co-host, Jason Hewlett, and this week we're discussing the Enfield Poltergeist. These teenage sisters believe they're haunted well. by a poltergeist. I was going to ask the same question as I asked earlier. How many voices are there? Six hundred. Six hundred the voices. I know the joke. How uh, many really are there, Margaret? I think so far we've had ten. Three. S um, sensible voices, but the rest of the names are absolute rubbish. Now I first heard about the Enfield Poltergeist because of the book This House is Haunted by Guy Lyon Playfair, which is a favorite of my friend and colleague Mike Stewart. But it wasn't until the second Conjuring movie came out and alleged Ed and Lorraine Warren were heavily involved in the case that I read Playfair's book to separate the fact from the fiction. Some call the Enfield Poltergeist one of the most witnessed and valid cases of paranormal activity of all time, while others say it's one of the biggest hoaxes of all time. Unlike in The Conjuring 2, Ed and Lorraine Warren actually had very little to do with the case, which increases people's skepticism about it. As Ed Warren was known to, shall we say, exaggerate his claims of paranormal activity, the story has been adapted in the 2015 BBC miniseries The Enfield Poltergeist, which fictionalized several parts of the story. The controversial BBC Halloween broadcast Ghost Watch is loosely based on the case as well, and the story itself is considered to be England's Amityville. I have a little bit of a background on this, obviously coming from England. Um, I, I researched this case quite a few years ago before it got publicized on um, media, uh, before it became famous with movies and stuff like that. So I, I have a little further background in relation to a lot of the books. Uh, I've watched a lot of the documentaries back in the UK based on it as well. So let's look at the facts. Um, in August 1977, uh, single, single parent Peggy Hodgson called the police to her rented home in Enfield, claiming that she had witnessed furniture moving and that two of her four children said that the knocking sounds were heard on walls. The children included Margaret, age 13, Janet, 11. Over a period of 18 months, more than 30 people, including neighbors, psychic researchers, and journalists, said that they saw furniture moving on its own accord, objects being thrown across the room, and the daughters seeming to levitate several feet off the ground. Many also heard and recorded knocking noises and gruff sound noises as well. Uh, the story was covered in the Daily Mirror until reports came into the end in 1979. Which is interesting in its own right, Peter, because you don't these kind of things don't get a ton of coverage nowadays, do they? What's interesting about it was the fact that it was very unique for that era. That kind of thing back then, uh, even like paranormal investigations and stuff like that, it was it was kind of unheard of. So it really, like the Enfield case, really put on the map paranormal investigations and what we actually do in the field. So it was very unique. So here's the evidence that sparked the alleged haunting. Maurice Gross of the Society of Psychic Research spent a great deal of time at the home where he says he witnessed over 2,000 incidences of activity. These included furniture being moved, fires starting on its own, Lego bricks flying across the air, hitting people, water filling cups and uh, strange noises and sounds. Janet alleges a curtain wrapped around her neck. Photographs show Janet and Margaret levitating above the beds. Uh, Baker and a lollipop lady backed up these claims saying that they saw Janet hovering above her bed and they looked through the window from the outside. Audio tapes exist of Janet speaking in an eerie voice, conveying a message from an old man who, who had died in the living room of the house several years earlier. Just before I died, I went blind and then I had a hemorrhage and I fell asleep and died in the chair in the corner of the downstairs, said the voice. In exploring the Enfield haunting, the Daily Mail spoke with Terry Wilkins, who said his father, Bill Wilkins, in, had indeed died in the chair in the living room. Police officer Carolyn Heaps signed an affidavit saying that she and her partner saw an armchair levitating half an inch and move about four feet across the floor. I think the lady officer actually saw the chair move or rise. It um, came off the floor or nearly a half inch, I should say, 
and I saw it slide off to the right, about three and a half to four feet before it came to rest. Um, I checked to see whether or not it could possibly have slid along the floor. I placed a marble on the floor to see whether or not the marble would um, go in the same direction as the chair did, and it didn't, it didn't roll at all. Um, I checked for wires under the cushion of the chair, and I could find no explanation at all. A gas heater was actually ripped from the wall by an unseen force, something that would have been very difficult for a teenager to do. All I can tell you is it's so heavy, I can't pick it up. But others who visited the house from the Society for Psychical Research found no evidence of paranormal activity. There was a kind of um, opposition that went to the extreme of saying, well, we don't believe a word of it. You know, there's, there's nothing happening. There's just a lot of hysterical people. Now, here's some evidence, Peter, to support the fact that it's a hoax. And when we mentioned earlier about the unseen force ripping a heater from the wall, which is something a teenager couldn't do, that's because Janet has admitted to falsifying evidence, including bending spoons, banging on ceilings and walls with a broom handle, among other things. She says about 2% of the activity was actually faked, which isn't a lot, but still, she's admitted to faking evidence, right? Children were perfectly okay. They, they played a few tricks which, which, which I would have been very surprised if they hadn't and we caught them and they, they knew we'd caught them and we just didn't discuss it, it was no big deal. He was on the ball with everything that happened and he knew in a sense whether we were playing the odd little game or when we weren't. An interview with Janet at the time of the activity suggests the idea of talking in a possessed voice may have been encouraged and planted in her mind by Maurice Gross. This, of course, is the Bill Wilkins voice that people mentioned Janet speaking in and that was quite heavily publicized in The Conjuring too. John Beloff, a former president of the Society for Psychical Research, investigated and suggested Janet fake the voice using ventriloquism. In fact, many society members expressed doubts about the case, believing Janet and Margaret staged much of it for journalists. This was fueled by, of course, the footage showing Janet bending some spoons. American magician Melbourne Christopher, that's a cool name, conducted his own investigation and said he failed to find anything paranormal at all and also believed the girls were falsifying evidence. A ventriloquist, Ray Allen, visited the house and concluded Janet, of course, was faking that eerie, eerie voice. As mentioned earlier, the fact that Ed and Lorraine Warren claimed to investigate, but they actually had very little to do with it, didn't they, Peter? Had nothing to do with it whatsoever. He had a recording of the voice. Yeah, apparently that they asked to attend the site and uh, they were refused by the society. There was also um, at one point, I think, didn't they even try with Janet? Like they filled her mouth with water, put tape over it, and the voice still came out. I've got to take some water in her mouth, taped over her mouth, and it still spoke. Hello, Mr. Playfair. Mum's sleeping, I'm talking. And then I said, all right, and I took the tape off, and uh, she spat the water out. Now, as far as I know, there's not a a ventriloquist in the world that can do that. That was fictionalized in the movie, I think. And that's kind of where, like, a lot of these cases that become heavily publicized, it gets really muddied. And we talked about that with Amityville, right? Like, where do you... People watch a BBC miniseries based on a true story or a movie like The Conjuring 2, which is based, you know, on the case falls Ed and Lorraine Warren, and they had jack to do with the thing, really. And it really changes people's perceptions about what actually did go on. And the book is quite a compelling book to read, uh, This House is Haunted. It was a very unique case at the time. And there were obviously, the, there was presented um, game for the family because they wanted to relocate to a bigger council house, which, yeah, that's fair. Uh, but the thing is that Enfield doesn't have, what I recall of working in Enfield, it doesn't have that kind of those bigger houses available. So I don't really see much depth in that. But um, it, it's an interesting case. And with the amount of so-called credible witnesses that made statements at that point, I mean, you had a police officer there as well that made a statement, which that shows some concrete as well. So what do you think then? Well, let's, let's sort of pass some judgment on this. I mean, there's enough there to make it certainly seem compelling. Um, but there are those who claim it's a hoax. Where do you your thoughts lie on this, Peter? Um, I'll be honest with you. I, I, I think that there's... I'm on the fence, honestly. I, I'm kind of leaning towards it being fake because once, once someone says that they're, you know, I've only faked two percent, and they're, you know, they openly admit of actually faking something, um, the likelihood of the rest of it being actually true, uh, I don't know. I think that they, the, any credibility that they might have had uh, maybe have been thrown out the window because of the fact she admitted that she faked things. Yeah, and so, that's kind of where I get stuck too. I mean, there are so many people that did see stuff. Like, oh, there's, there's almost so much evidence to support that there is something going on. But as, as soon as you cast even a little bit of doubt in, 
it's really hard to take any of it at face value, isn't it? I, I want to believe the story, but they just have a little bit of doubt that it's hard for me to grasp it completely. But it's a compelling case, definitely. Yeah, and, I, and the book is worth the read. Yeah, I, I think I just spoke myself out of being on the fence. I think it's probably fake, actually. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we'll be back next month with another case that we're going to dissect. Uh, until then, I'm Jason Hewlett. I'm Peter Wren. So stay spooky.